And uh, for the rest of us, I invite you to take your Bibles or your apps on your phone and uh, find uh, the book of Romans, chapter 1. Romans 1 will be in verses 8 through 15. As we're uh, singing those songs of worship, it's interesting the Father just uh, reminds us different things at different times. And uh, I do want to acknowledge and uh, direct your attention to the fact that uh, KP uh, Stevens also had a medical thing going on this week and is not able to be here this morning in person because of that. And so keep KP in prayer. And I know that uh, Jody would appreciate prayer for her son, Dennis, who's looking at significant surgery, heart surgery on Thursday. And so I'm just letting us re- be reminded about that as a church family. But we, we take time for that because it's vitally important. And um, as we continue to look to God's word together, would you just join with me as we pray? Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this word that is so true, eternal, unchanging, speaks to our hearts and changes us from the inside out. Father, we thank you. We can pray for dear ones that we care about, that they might know your healing presence and touch and those kinds of things. And God, that's significant, important. Uh, Lord, I think about uh, Kurt and Karina today as well, that you be the God who comforts and encourages them. Lord, in the midst of all that life brings, you invite us to turn our eyes to you and allow you to speak to our hearts and grow us to become more and more like Christ. It's your desire that we would resemble Jesus more and more in heart and mind and attitude. And so, God, would you take your word this morning, apply it, and help us to indeed be transformed by it because it's alive and powerful. And we thank you in advance for what you're going to speak and what you're going to do. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Anybody know who Max Lucado is? All right. So I got one of his books up here. It's called You're Never Alone. Um, Max is a writer I've always appreciated, and he just has a way with words, doesn't he? And... Um, in this particular book, You're Never Alone, chapter 5, he has, he has a chapter story. He always starts with a story of some kind. And um, I love how he starts this, though. He says, um, this story qualifies him for admission into a diminishing population. In fact, the younger generation might think that he's uh, engaging in hyperbole or exaggeration. Um, but they're going to say no one's been around that long. You know, nobody can remember that far back. And so then Max uh, writes in chapter 5, he says, As God is my witness, I'm alive, I was there, and I remember the day when email showed up. (laughs) He said, I thought it was just a passing fad, you know, it's kind of like slinkies and slip and slides. He was wrong about those too. Um, But he said, I was really intimidated by the world of computers. And he puts it this way, this world of computers. It was New York City, and I was the country hick. It was Beethoven's fifth, and I was playing chopsticks. It's the Pacific Ocean, and I was the minnow. I mean, can you catch it? Max was just intimidated by those kinds of things. He said, I went to sleep one night in a world of sticky notes. And I I woke up the next morning to a paperless society. And my younger church staff had been dreaming of this for months. And they're saying to Max, Max, it's easy. You just, you just type, you take the mouse, and you click, and presto, this email is sent. No more snail mail. And Max is going, I just don't get it. <laughs> and it was a great struggle for him. He, he just acknowledges those kinds of things, just being open and honest in that way, right? I'll let you go to the book. It's called uh, You're Never Alone, and you, you can look at that. The reason I drew that to our attention is... Um, this past couple of weeks, Max wrote a new uh, article that was actually became, it made headline news in, in some ways because Max says, I need to tell you the real story, my story, because many look at me and say, well, I'm this mega church pastor, so successful, this uh, successful writer. Some have called me America's pastor, but you need to know the real story. And Max proceeds to get real and talk about what it's like to be a broken human being who has sin in his life just as you and I have sin in our lives. And, and Max gets real, and, and he just opens up, and he talks about the challenges of, 
um, pastoring a mega church and the deadlines with all the writing and all those kinds of things and, and how he, he became overwhelmed and was burning out. And he even got to the place where he started drinking secretly to deal with the stress and anxiety in his life. He would go to a distant store and buy a bottle of alcohol and put it in a brown paper bag and find a quiet place. And, and Max said, I was just so broken. And God met me in my brokenness. And I experienced what Jacob did, that God doesn't give up on you because you're broken. But instead, he confronts you with that which you need to deal with and invites you to step out in obedience to the Father. I got to tell you that that took courage to write that story openly and let people in. And I appreciate so much that he was willing to do that. I, I just appreciate that he could say, I'm a person just like you are, and I'm broken like you are, and I desperately need the God who wants to rescue us from all of that. Some of you know that uh, Diane and I moved here from the Twin Cities about seven years ago, and um, you know, Minnesota, there's a lot to like there. They have trees. It's green a lot of the time, though the mosquitoes are rather large. They have 10,000 plus lakes. There's a lot of things to enjoy, and I love walking through the hardwood forest and things like that. But there was something, well, I got to say this too. If you're Scandinavian, there's a place for you. It's called the Scandinavian Riviera. It's the North Shore on Lake Superior. A little cold, but you would enjoy it, right? It's, it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. It was one of our favorite places to go. Something I didn't enjoy so much about Minnesota was this thing that's called Minnesota Nice. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but here's how it works. Minnesota Nice works like this. When you talk to somebody, you never tell them what you really think or feel. What you do is you just tell them what you think they want to hear. And so you fake it. And you just tell people what you think they want to hear. And you really don't let them see your heart or your feelings, and you're kind of left guessing. And that never sat well with me, and I struggle with that tremendously because it always felt so fake and not authentic and insincere, and I just wrestled with that. It was definitely not nice to not know what someone's really thinking or feeling, and you're left with a different impression. We're in a culture that is far less trusting. And, and we're in a culture where people are very guarded and careful about what they might let others in on. We block phone numbers. We unfriend people on social media. We peer at the visitor through our video camera thing at the doorbell, right? And whether we decide we're even going to come to the door or turn on the outside light, those kinds of things. We, we live in this kind of culture. We're suspicious. We're wary. We're behind locked doors. I hate to say it, but as a church family, I mean, we have to keep our doors locked in daylight hours to keep people safe in the building because we don't know who's showing up. We love to welcome people, and we do. We open the door, but we actually have to keep them secure for a reason. It's hard to let people in when that's true. And what God wants to invite you and I to do this morning is to recognize that as brothers and sisters in Christ, as the church family, he says, I want you to understand that as my people, I want you to be willing to be real. Be authentic. Let people into your heart. Let people into your life. Allow them to see in, just as Max described, something of his life. This is what it means to be a Christ follower. We allow each other in to our lives in that way and be transparent. As you and I look in Romans chapter 1, verses 8 and following, the Apostle Paul models this for us. These are some personal notes, some personal thoughts that he's sharing with the church, having introduced himself. For those who may not have been here the last few weeks, remember Paul is in Corinth, it's 57 AD. He's writing to the believers in Rome, the center of the Roman Empire. And um, there are several hundred believers at that time in the city of Rome. There's those who are free Roman citizens, others who are slaves. In fact, probably the majority were slaves. There were Messianic Jews. There were non-Jewish people, different countries and people groups represented. They're all together in this network of house churches. And Paul's writing this letter to them to help them treasure Christ and understand this gospel, this good news that God has given, and it's his solution for a fallen, broken, dying world. 
Paul says, I just want you to understand that. And so last week, we, we looked in particular at the introduction of this letter. And, and as Paul introduces himself, because you see, he's never met most of these people before. They may have heard about him, but they don't know him in person. And so last weekend, we watched as Paul identified himself. He used some words, you know, Christ bond slave. I, I'm, Christ is my master and I'm the slave. Yes, I'm free, but I'm Christ's slave. And also an apostle in that I'm his ambassador, his sent one, and I'm to bring this good news of Christ to others. And, and I've been uh, uh, commissioned by God to call people out, Jew and non-Jew, to represent Christ as Lord and invite them to pre- uh, put their faith in Christ in that way. All of that's the introduction. That's verses 1 through 7. So if you look with me at verse 8 and following in Romans chapter 1, Paul begins to express some personal thoughts. And, and you know, the first words off his uh, lips are these words, right? First and foremost, verse 8, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. And so Paul is, is stirred up in his heart in thanking God for these believers in Christ and the obedience that follows their belief. And notice he emphasizes, I thank God for all of you. It's not about your background. I mean, if you're a Jewish follower of Jesus, I thank God for you. You're you're a Gentile follower of Jesus, I thank God for you. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman and young or old or what your past or your background is. I just thank God that you have a faith in Christ and the obedience that comes from that. In fact, the reputation of your faith has spread. It's gone global. Now, there's a little bit of hyperbole and exaggeration here. Paul is not trying to say that in every corner of the world, everybody has heard about Jesus. That's not what he's saying. But he is saying that as the far reaches of the Roman Empire, word has gotten around about this group of believers in Rome and their faith in Christ. And that reputation is literally in the farthest reaches of that Roman Empire, so the the world in that way. And here's what's so big about that, because their pledge of allegiance to Jesus is, Jesus Christ is what? Lord. Where do they live? The capital city of the Roman Empire, where Caesar, who's in charge, the king in charge, demands that people do what? Confess that Caesar is Lord. It takes faith and bold faith to stand against that and to represent, no, there is only one Lord and it's Christ. And so your faith has gone global in that sense. And I thank God that you've got this incredible faith. And Paul goes on though in verse nine says, and as God is my witness, did you hear that earlier? Max used that language, as God is my witness. Here it's in the scriptures, right? As God is my witness, whom I serve with my whole heart in preaching the gospel of his son. Just in those words, Paul's saying, remember, it's all about Jesus. It's all about the Messiah. It's all about what Christ has done on the cross. And and I serve him. He's my master. I serve him with all my heart. This is my act of worship. In fact, if you looked at Romans 12, 1, it says, present yourself as a living sacrifice. Paul is just modeling that for us right here. It says, I thank God for you. And as God is my witness, and as I serve him, and I represent the gospel of Christ because I have you in my heart, I'm so grateful for that partnership, but here's what I want you to know. I'm praying for you. I don't know you in person, but I'm still praying for you, right? I'm praying for you over and over again. In fact, he says, I pray for you all the time, crying out to God on your behalf. I don't have to meet you to pray for you. I can pray for people I don't know. And so Paul does. In fact, it What he's really representing here is, I pray for you the way I pray for the church where I'm writing this letter in Corinth. I know a lot of the people here in Corinth. I've lived here for a while. I know these people. I pray for them. And I pray for what's going on in that church. And indeed, if you look in his letters, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, all of those represent groups of Christians. And he says, I pray for these churches too. I pray for them all. And I constantly lift you up to the Father. Even though I've never met some of you in person, I pray for you in that way. I want to encourage you as a church family that God's been helping us to live this out. You may not know this, but um, those who are elders in our church family, we, we meet every week, Tuesdays at 6.30 in the morning. 
And in that time, we take some time in the word and it's our joy and our privilege to pray for this church family, for whatever's going on, the things that we understand, the things that God may have shown us, and just praying over this church family. Friends, that has been going on week after week after week and year after year after year. God God invited us to live that out. And even if we don't know you that well, we may just have, well, do you know, I'm not sure who this person is, but the Lord knows, so we're going to pray for him anyway. Um, That's how we want to pray. I'm just wondering, how does that look in your life? Are you grateful for the faith of other believers, as Paul expressed it? Does it stir your heart to be praying for people that you might not know? I guarantee you there's some um, cards out on the table in the lobby where the, it talks about global mission, and they're prayer cards. And we've met a number of those people that are represented with those prayer cards. They've been here recently, and then there are others that we've not met because they've been overseas or in other places for quite a while. Do you pray for them? Is it a little intimidating to pray for someone that you don't know? How about we just get real for a moment and say, Lord, you know them. And so I don't have to know them personally to pray for them. But if I follow the example of Paul, you might lay them on my heart and I know I could pray for them and for the part of the world where they serve. And and Lord, we could do that. We could pray for each other in that way. So what a wonderful opportunity to be thankful and, and then to pray. Now, as Paul Uh, continues in this letter, it's like he says, I want you to come and look over my shoulder as I write my prayer journal. Because I I just want you to see how I'm praying for you. So notice with me, uh, verse 10, Paul, Paul says this, he says, I pray that now at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. And and the sense here in the original language is that Paul is just passionate about this. This is a deep longing in his heart. He longs to go to Rome and to be with these believers in Christ. And it's been a longing on his heart for a long time. In fact, he mentions it in verse 13. uh, He's lifted this petition up over and over to heaven. Lord, if it's time, would you allow me to go now? Would you let me get to Rome? I just, I long to be there. I want to be with this group of believers in Christ. Lord, if it's according to your will and your purpose, would you help that to happen? Now remember, as Paul's writing this letter, he's careful in what he says and how he says it because as much as he's wanting to go to Rome, he's already let let them know and he's going to let them know a little more in this letter. Um, I need to go to Jerusalem first. Uh, I want to come to Rome and it's what's on my heart and I long to be there, but I'm going to come via Jerusalem and make my way there. Now, it doesn't go as Paul planned as he writes this letter, and you'll find that out later on, right? But his heart is, I I want you to know, I've been praying for you, and one of my prayers is the opportunity to come and be with you and share that time. And he goes on in verse 11 and says, here's what's on my mind. If I can come to Rome, God, if you would open that way for me, what I want to do is I want to pass on blessing. I want to impart a spiritual blessing to this church family. As I gather with them and and we have ministry time together and a time like we're doing right now this morning, it's a time to strengthen them in their faith, to build into them, right? And and help them go deeper in Christ and be anchored uh, to Christ. Many times when we study the life of Paul as he wrote so much of the New Testament, we're all about, well, Paul was an evangelist. He planted churches. He shared about Jesus to people who never heard about Jesus. And he did. He did a lot of that. And that's on his heart all the time. You can hear it in these opening words, can't you? I just, it's all about the gospel. It's about Jesus' son, and I want to share that. But never forget, he has this huge heart for the church, this church that God is establishing and planting throughout the Roman Empire. And his desire is to strengthen believers and help them grow even deeper in Christ. Now think about this. They're living in Rome. I want you to picture a rotten apple with a worm hanging out of it. Would you like to take a bite of that? This is where they live. And Paul says, I'm praying for you, and I want to impart blessing. I want to strengthen you in Christ. You live in the center of this empire. There are corrupt, immoral, evil people where you live, many of them, that control an incredible superpower of this entire empire. I am praying for you, and I want to be there and strengthen you as a church because of where you live. In many ways, would that not sound like 
inviting a, a prayer meeting that happens over and over again in a strengthening time in Washington, D.C. And I praise God, we have believers in Christ who do ministry in Washington, D.C. all the time. Prayer meetings and other things. And they're there to strengthen leaders to understand who they are and what it means to be a follower of Christ. Paul says, I want to I impart this kind of blessing in the church but I don't want you to think that it's a one-way street. And so, again, Paul's being very real. There's no hidden agenda here. He just lays it out the way it is. Notice verse 12, that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I'm not only wanting to come to the church and pour something out in the life of the church, but frankly, I'm expecting to receive. Your faith is going to encourage my faith. You see, we need each other that way. So the preacher was being encouraged by the faith of the people and then he came to the people to encourage their faith. And there's this two-way street that's, that's so important. This thing about encouragement, why is it so important? Well, Hebrews tells us, doesn't it? In the book of Hebrews, it says, as long as it's called today, encourage each other, right? Encourage each other so you don't fall away into sin and unbelief that causes us to turn away from the living God. Friends, we live in a hostile world that is battling you and I daily in our faith and is beating on us daily in our faith. And so daily we need what? Encouragement. Paul says, I want to come and encourage you, and I want to be encouraged in the midst of. What an incredibly important concept that is, isn't it? That, that uh, we would understand the value of that. And so I would just say again, I'm so glad we have friends that watch our service online. Where there's a number of folks. Some folks just can't get out. It, it's not possible physically for them to do that. So they do the streaming thing and and or the uh, recording of the service. That's wonderful. But I got to tell you that what we're doing here right now, face to face, is far more encouraging than online. We made it work during COVID. We we made things work in ways that we had never done before, right? But I got to tell you, we were starved to do this. I remember the first Sunday back and there was a sweet, sweet spirit in this building as we gathered for worship and it was face to face and there was encouragement one to another. And the Apostle Paul is just praying in that same way and saying, we need this encouragement. It goes two ways. It goes two ways. You might write down a couple of these passages as you're thinking about encouragement in the scriptures Psalm 119, verse 28 says, My soul is weary with sorrow. I think some of us can identify with that. We, we've lost many loved ones in this past year. Weary with sorrow. The psalmist cries out, Strengthen me according to your word. This heart of prayer, asking for God to be that source of strength, encouragement. Isaiah 41, verse 10, Fear not, I am with you. Don't be dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God says, let's hold hands, right? I'm going to walk with you like a, a grandfather with a grandchild. I'm just Let's walk together. God says, I, I want to offer that encouragement to you. Jesus, praying for Peter, he says in Luke 22, I pray for you, Peter, that your faith may not fail. And all you, Peter, will deny me, Jesus says, I pray to you that when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. Offer encouragement. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, his prayer for the church. I pray that out of God's glorious riches, he will strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inmost being so that God, uh, Christ rather, may dwell in your hearts uh, through faith. Friends, we need this encouragement, don't we? And as Paul is letting us look in his prayer journal, he just says, church, I just want you to know, here's how I'm praying for you. This is what I love to do. And, and God, if you would open that way, I just long to impart this blessing and to be blessed in, in return in the same way. He bears his heart for the church, right? Verse 13, I don't want you to remain unaware. Let me turn that phrase around. In other words, I want you to know, right? I want you to know exactly what's going on. And, and so as he's inviting the church to partner with him, he says in verse 13, I plan to come to you many times, but I've been prevented from doing so until now. So again, Paul is not running from a hidden agenda. He's being real. He's being open, transparent. He's allowing people to see into his heart. He's got nothing to hide. Many times as he's been planting churches to the east, east of Rome, 
As he's been diligently planning in that way, his eyes and his heart have been looking west and thinking about the believers in Rome, those several hundred believers that are in house churches there. And he's going, I just long to go, and I made plans, and, and I was going to do it, but then the Lord had other things that came up, and I needed to turn and, and go this direction instead. And so those plans never came to fruition. He said, I just want you to know, I've tried many times to come, and it just hasn't happened. Despite these good intentions, I've been prevented from coming. Now, hopefully when you and I read those words, we're asking ourselves, so what stopped you? I mean, what was really preventing you? There's a couple options here, isn't there? In Acts chapter 19 and verse 22, Paul there also says, I want to visit Rome. But in that portion of Acts, we read a lot about opposition, fierce opposition that Paul faced. There was the riot in Ephesus that ended up redirecting him from the province of Asia over to Macedonia, what we call Greece today. There's just this spiritual opposition that rises up and, and things were happening. And so could that have been what was preventing him from getting to Rome? In Romans chapter 15 and verses 20 through 22, Paul says, it's always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ is not known. And that's why I've often been hindered from coming to you. So later in this same letter, he says, one of the reasons I haven't been able to get to you is because I, I've been trying to preach the gospel of Christ where he, Christ has never been heard, and, and because of that priority over here, I haven't been able to go over to you, over this side. And so the scripture talks about taking Christ to those unreached places. And could it be that, uh, thirdly, the spirit of Jesus just simply said to Paul, the door is shut here, like he does in the book of Acts. When Paul and his church planning team were trying to get into the province of Asia and Bithynia, twice in Acts 16, verses 6 through 7, it says, the spirit of Jesus stopped us. The spirit of Jesus would not let us go there. We're not told specifically in this portion of Romans how this works. I believe that we should let Scripture interpret Scripture. So Romans 15 has bearing on what this means. And I want to suggest to you, I think the Spirit of Christ was speaking to Paul and saying, Paul, as much as you want to go there, the priority is over here right now. And so that door is closed, but this door is open. Go where the door is open. And because Paul is the servant of Christ, he went in that direction. And so that kept him from coming all of these years. And again, he's bearing his heart to these believers in, in Rome and saying, I really do want to come. And, and by the way, when I come, what is it that I'd like to do? I want to have a harvest. Amongst you, he writes. You notice that? Now, I don't believe he's saying to these believers, uh, I'm not sure that all you guys are saved, so I'm going to come to the church and make sure you're all saved. I don't think that's what Paul's saying at all. I think what Paul's saying is, I want to come to the city of Rome where you live, and amongst you, I want to share the gospel of Christ with those who have not yet heard about Christ. And I want to see harvest in that. I want to see people come to faith in Christ, and yet some of the harvest, the fruit would also be that your faith is strengthened at the same time. Because remember, I want to impart blessing on the church. So new believers in Christ, blessing in the church. This is Paul's heart. I want to see some spiritual fruit. Think about the irony of this. There's a group of people in the center of the Roman Empire in Rome itself who confess Jesus Christ as Lord, even though Caesar's on the throne there. And in fact, if you were to read in other portions of the scripture there, for example, in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 22, it says that there are believers in the household of Caesar. There are Christ followers, people have come to faith in Christ, who actually work for Caesar. Now talk about a conflict of interest, right? When your confession is Christ is Lord, but I work for the king. Nonetheless, they were faithful to Christ in all of that. And so his, his desire is let there be spiritual fruit. I, I want to come for that purpose. And then verse 14 he says, let me tell you why it's all about preaching Christ. I have this solemn obligation, this responsibility to Greeks and to the non-Greeks, it says in some translations. To other translations, it says to the barbarians, to the, the civilized and the uncivilized, to the wise and to the foolish. That's, that's saying to the educated and the uneducated. Paul says, I have this solemn weight and responsibility to represent Christ to those who have never heard of him. Whether they can speak the Greek language or some other language that I can't even understand. 
whether they're scholars, philosophers, remember Athens, remember Corinth, whether they have that category of, of education or they're just uneducated, they're, they're fishermen, they're peasants, they're, they're people that are slaves, they're, they, they don't have education. And it doesn't matter, though, because they're made in the image of God, they're highly valued, and it's worth the effort I want to bring Christ to each and every one. I want to share Christ in that way. And so verse 15, that's why I'm so eager to proclaim God's good news to you who are in Rome. This is why. You know, 1 John chapter 3 and verse 14, there's a little test. It says, we know we've passed from death to life, eternal life in Christ, because we love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Paul passes the test, right? His heart is for these brothers and sisters in Christ. And he longs to be with them, and he wants to bless them and pour it out in that way. I hope by now, as you've listened over Paul's shoulder, as you've heard his personal notes of concern and so forth, as you've heard him be very, very real, I, I, I hope that you might be asking yourself this morning, as I have been all week long in this passage, how does this help me in my faith? God, what would you have me to do with this? Can I suggest there's at least three responses? The first might be this. How passionate am I about talking to other people about Jesus? If Christ has saved me, if Christ has given me life, an entire new life, and Christ paid the price for me on that cross, and, and Jesus did all of that for me, am I passionate about telling other people about the one who saved me, the one who made me who I am? If there's anything good that's happening in my life, it's because of Christ, not because of me. And so if there's something good there that's attractive to other people, chalk it up to Jesus. And can I talk to you about that? Is, I'm wondering, how passionate are we about telling others about Jesus? We talked about blessing our neighbors. How's it going? Remember, we took five Sundays this summer to talk about what it is. Remember that word, bless? It's what? Begin with prayer? Listen? Eat together? Serve our neighbors? And what? Share our story. Talk about. How's it going? You're going to hear me cycle back that over and over again this fall because I believe God wants you and I to be a messenger of blessing just like Paul is seeking to be in this verse as we just read. The second application might look this way. How open am I with the people around me? Do I let people get into my heart and life? Am I transparent? Am I willing to let people in? It's a hard call, isn't it? It's challenging. It's risky. But am I just playing Minnesota nice? Or am I being real? And especially in the body of Christ. That's so significant, so much needed, right? And unless we can be honest about struggles and talk about stuff that's really going on on the inside, it's hard to really have the relationship building that God wants for us. And then that frees the Lord to just do what he wants to do in our hearts. We've got to be willing to be open and real with each other. It's not a new problem. If you look in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11, uh, Paul goes on record with these Corinthians that, remember he's writing his letter from Corinth to the Romans. But in 2 Corinthians, he goes on record with them and, and he says this, open wide your hearts. He says, we've opened our hearts wide open to you in ministering to you. And yet it feels like you're being squeezed, squeezing us out of your hearts. It feels like you're closing your hearts to us. He says, let's make this fair exchange. We open our hearts to you. Open your hearts to us. Friends, this isn't a new issue in the church. It's been around a long time. But, but God actually invites us to be real and authentic and transparent with each other. Now, I understand there's some trust things, and we've got to be wise in those things. I understand that. But, but at the same time, am I willing to risk letting someone in even a little bit in the desire to be real? And authentic. I believe Paul models for us what it means to be real, and he's inviting us to be authentic in, in that kind of way. And then remember, as Paul prayed for the church, are we willing to pray for people in the church? Yes, praying constantly for each other, but also those that we don't yet know, those that we've never met before. And yet God in some way says, I want you to pray for this person. There's a young lady uh, whose card's out on the table there. Her name's Cassandra. 
She's only recently gone to where she's serving in, and prayer would be a good thing for Cassandra. There's another gal there, a single gal that's working in another part of the world, and she's helping uh, the children of IWs to get an education so that their parents can serve as IWs. Both of those individuals could use prayer, of course. And they actually happen to be part of our Rocky Mountain District family. And they didn't come from this church, but they came from a church in our district. So we've got opportunities, don't we? And, and God's just inviting us to be real and authentic and to uh, live our faith out, just as the Apostle Paul has modeled for us. Our worship team is going to come. We're going to close our service in a uh, closing song together. And uh, it's an invitation to the Holy Spirit to work in us and through us. I, I just invite us this morning, Lord, what is it you're speaking to my heart? And how can I just simply live out the faith that you've placed in my heart through Christ. And, and be real in that. Be authentic in that. As our team comes, would you make this closing song part of our response to the Lord?